Okay. We could all come closer if you guys want. Or you're welcome to stay where you are. <laughs> Not that scary. It's all right. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get started because we've got a lot of content and people will probably be dancing about given all the wonderful speakers. Welcome. My name is Vale Dixon. I hail from Buckingham, Virginia originally. I moved one county over, now in Nelson County in the Piedmont, uh, Ridge and Valley region of Virginia, foothills of the Blue Ridge. I'm a red clay specialist, I guess, <laughs> would be my <laughs> red dirt girl specialist. Um, I'm a farmer, regenerative farmer, and I'm building a model of mentorship learning for farmers and backyard gardeners, anyone who wants to learn how to heal their soil. Um, mentorship being a way of learning that's different than apprenticeship or internship where uh, we're actually using technology to build this kind of mycorrhizal learning experience where it's not just, okay, here's your learning modules and your online modules. We use the online learning and videos and online hub, but we also get together in person um, live and on the phone and we support each other and learn from each other in these live interactive experiences. So if you're interested in mentorship or either you have a topic that you want to teach in that model of learning, my vision was I started a mentorship program for grazers called Grazing Power and we're building one for growers called Grow Your Soil and um, I envisioned that this model of learning kind of populate the world in not only regenerative agriculture but all regenerative living and, and help us connect and build a new world. So that's my mission um, and vision. Today's talk is very specifically focused more on practical things, um, but I will be tying it into some of the larger picture things that drive me and I believe drive a lot of this movement. So today's talk is called Discover the Stages of Soil Cover. Unearth your own blind spots to rapidly heal your soil because a lot of us have heard that it's important to keep our soil covered and in our programs when we work with people more closely whether it's a large-scale organic no-till cropper who's been no-till and having production problems or a small-scale backyard gardener or a grazer one of the most common things that we work with um, is that maybe they think their soil is covered or maybe they don't understand what covering their soil really means, or maybe they have gaps in their system where their soil is losing um, traction in improving, and their soil, your soil could be, uh, it's one of the biggest bang for your buck places you can work on your system. Because I could give you all the right microbes in a microbial inoculant, seed inoculant, spray, tea, compost, I could give you all the right minerals to put on your fields. I could give you all the right grazing rotations or cropping rotations to plant and cover crop species mixtures. But if your soil isn't covered, it's like the base of the foundation for the whole system to work. So really, there's a lot to this we're finding. And we thought it was kind of simple, like keep your soil covered. But in years of doing this work with people, there are so many interpretations that people understand and how they've interpreted it in, in their system. So I would love to go deeper into your guys' systems. I'll be available. I can't cover everything in this hour and a half, but we do cover more in our programs, much more in detail. And I'll be available after this talk. I also have a booth um, out there. You'll see the logo. And I'll be available from here on out through the conference and staying even Sunday night. So if you can't catch me or get your question answered in this hour and a half, please be sure to approach me. Um, I did want to, before we start, I left an index card and a packet of information on your tables. And um, the index card is to help us build better modules in our learning. If you wanted to share with us what is your biggest challenge in your system, it could be a growing challenge, an agronomic challenge, it could be a human resource challenge, it could be a money challenge. What, is your, what are your biggest challenges in your own words? Like the, what keeps you up at night when you're not editing? Um, we really want to know because those are the kind of things we want to build support systems to address. So if you can share that with me and then either leave it up here or just leave it at your table, um, I'll collect them at the end and that will help us keep going on our path to building better mentorships. 
The other uh, information is some information about our programs, and if you keep going, there's some different things we use, like one of them is a grazing success checklist. It shows all the things we measure about our soil, plants, and animals every day in our system. It doesn't give you all the details of the different things, possibilities, what you could find. Um, there's a nature's principles handout. There's a disturbances chart. There's lots of goodies for you to look over in your own time. And um, also I wanna mention if you sign up on the sheet, we will send you the slides and let you know we'll be developing more resources about soil cover because this is like the next phase of what we're really building out in our program. So we will get, let you know about those free resources when they're available, as well as free videos, tips, things we put out to our mailing list. So if you're interested, um, there's a sign up in the front. So how many of you guys struggle with anything like weeds, pests, diseases, any kind of lower than desired yield quantity or quality of your crop? but you really are committed to not using like excessive tillage or chemicals. Anybody here? Like yeah. everybody, anybody not? Anybody has like absolutely everything they want in their growing system producing? I mean, it's always a dynamic range, right? It's never a static destination and we'll talk about that, but I'm included with that and I'm starting over on a farm. Um, I started over five years ago with my own farm. I've been working on a lot of different farms my family farms in diff 14 different counties, and I've worked in large-scale organic no-till cropping systems for a few different years, and this is my last field day in my um, backyard situation. Kind of a variety of vegetables and mixes, um, but right now our farm is a regional training center for grazing and, whole and permaculture. We started with the grazing animals to convert a corn and soybean farm that was heavily chemicaled into um, a diversified perennial agriculture system with we're planting fruit trees and nut trees and perennial crops and annual vegetables. And so we've got a lot of different systems going on on our farm. Um, but would you guys be interested in diving deeper into a tool that really is the most bang for your buck investment of time? If you're going to put time and money and energy in your system, this one has got to be there. Anybody interested in that? Because it sounds kind of dry, right? Soil cover. It's like, OK, let's talk about soil cover. But it really is, um, without it, other tools don't work. So that's and with it other tools work incredibly fast so that's the juicy side of it is like we've been able to heal landscapes in incredible amounts of time short amounts of time when we can unlock all the pieces so this is for you if you've heard that your weeds insects diseases and production problems will go away if you heal your soil or take care of your soil but you really are looking for more practical things that you could implement now in your system um, and for those of you coming welcome uh, there's an index card for you to write your biggest challenge, and there's a sign-up in the front if you'd like to get the slides or any free videos or tips. Okay, so how do we get the most bang for our buck, right? Because who here has excessive time, like, you know, just leisurely time in their systems? I don't, or excessive money that they'd wish they could spend more of. Um, so that's, there's, we're going to go into why soil cover is so important, and we're going to go through some stages of soil cover, um, because it's not just like your soil's covered or not. I mean, in the end, it is. There's like a sufficient range, and then there's like even better. But there's a lot of gradients in between, and during the growing year, depending on where you are in your production cycle, you could be at one stage or the other. So I think it's important to talk about, and um, we really want you to leave with some ideas of what you could do right now. And if you don't leave with that, please come see me. Um, I'm going to show you some things that I've done, and that may give you some ideas. We'll talk about some questions that you may be rhetorically answering in your head, but we can also talk about it in detail later together one-on-one -on -one, or if you know I'll stay as long as I can in the room and then after in the hallway or whatever so prerequisites to being successful in your system really thinking about we are the managers of our systems of our bodies of our families of our teams of our farm where decision makers our input really counts and a wise mentor of mine an Amish mentor said once the hardest ground you'll ever face is that between your ears so you know, if you're trying to deal with soil compaction and soil problems, let's look at the soil inside ourselves and our thoughts um, that we're focusing on what we really want to create and not fixating on the problem too much. Uh, and so the nature's principles are in your handout packet. Learn them. Dive deeply into them. Dive deeply into nature. Everything that I've learned has come from nature. Um, I've had great mentors in books and things, but really the learning comes when you're interacting with your plants and animals and soil and ecosystem and yourself. 
um, your body is an important part of that ecosystem and the feedback from your body. So we're going to go into some tools and techniques and strategies, um, some timing and patterning of those tools. So it's one thing to learn about a tool like a hammer. Okay, that's great. You know there's a hammer and you know how to use a drill. Those are tools. How do you use the hammer, right? Like you can just like sling it like sideways. You, you know, you've seen a really good framer. They are really skilled with the hammer. You can tap it gently. You know, you can pry with it. There's lots of ways you can, techniques of using that same tool. And then the strategies, what we found and why this soil cover is so important is the strategies are the dynamic interactions of the timing and the patterning of how you're using that tool and technique. So when do you use the hammer, like really beat on something? And when do you use, stop using the hammer and pick up a drill? And when do you stop using the drill and just wait and observe? Like, and when do you like go back to using that hammer, but very delicately, right? So there's a lot of tools and strategies, and I can guarantee you we can't get into all of them today. So if you are interested, please join our mailing list, talk to us, sign up for some implementation programs so we can help implement together. Because I can't teach you all the tools today, much less the techniques, much less the strategies today in an hour and a half. But that is something that I want you to understand the difference between okay, you might learn about seed inoculants, or you might learn about foliar sprays, or you might learn about soil testing, or um, how to use your animals in your system, or any kind of tool, but the real results over the long term continue success and progression result when we can be skillful in our application of those tools. So that's where like the devils in the details kind of thing happens. And that's where the artistry, if you look at a farmer or someone you emulate, finding a mentor who has experience, they're an artist, they're doing it. Watch, like observe, like how do they switch between these tools? When do they observe? When do they act? Our energy is so precious. Our thoughts matter. It's our conscious choice when we act in our system and when we dynamically step back and let the system respond and we listen. So there's like, no one enjoys a conversation when it's just one way. And so you can learn to dance with your system. You can learn to listen to the responses of your system. And your mentors of your plants and animals will be some of your greatest mentors. Your guidance, your inner wisdom, your gut, whatever you want to call it, your spirit, that will be one of your biggest mentors. Um, and so if that's all you get out of today's talk and you don't remember anything I said about soil cover, like that's so important. Um, these prerequisites to success. I did a talk last year, if you're interested, on building a mycorrhizal movement and how each of us, it's important to do less with a different focus and connect. Because this mirroring a mycorrhizal movement, the mycorrhizal fungi or the fungi connect, the fungi is not running around trying to be the doer. The fungi just is and it starts to grow and have relationship. It, but through its beingness of being a fungi, a lot of work is done. Our plants are fertilized, our groundwater is filtered, our climate, our carbon is sequestered. And so I really, really, the message that I'm getting to spread around this planet and, and really practicing at deep levels myself is, how do I actually mirror nature? How can I design my system and myself? How can I actually be a human being and less of a human doing? And how can I connect with other human beings being what they're being which actually involves more spaciousness in our life, right? More time to be, more time to connect. And I can tell you that some of the greatest insights about soil cover or whatever technique came when I actually sat down in my field or I was in a state of beingness, not just with my to-do list in my head, doing my things I'm doing when I'm walking around the field, but being present and somehow like a little bug would land on me or, um, not being in my head with my problem and thinking it out, but being present and breathing in my system and some messenger will come to me, my animal will show me something, the bug will land on me and I'll follow the bug and the bug will show me something. Or like, when you're not seeking it so hard, that's when the answers come. So I love to talk about waves and patterns in nature and if you think about it, the wave is also a spiral, and as the water falls, it may even be a branching pattern. If you think about a waterfall, or there's some kind of pattern in this chaos. So every moment is like, we have this ordered, highly ordered, I can't get the swoop right with the pointer, but 
we have this beautiful order of our lives, of who we are, our story about our farm, our story about what's going on in our system, our story about our problems, and we've ordered it. Our minds make order out of things, so we've ordered it perfectly, and there is a divine order to it, but if we can, in each moment, in each breath, in each cell, in each replication of our DNA, in each decision we make on our farm, just allow the other part of that wave, which looks like chaos, right, and destruction, like, holy crap. Right? And any of you, I surf, I don't know if anybody here surfs, but like if you get caught in that part of the wave, it's really like quite, um, it feels like chaos, right? It's, it's the barrel. So in each moment in our lives, in each relationship, you know, this is infinite potential. These things can reorganize. And if we are too confined in the order, it's like the listening and the um, talking or the receiving. We have to balance both. And... Um, that's just my approach. Um, and so really we can start to enjoy the explosion into chaos, which is actually our infinite <coughs> worth. And um, if you're doing too much on your farm, sometimes it's better to focus on the basics, on your health, on your soil cover, like dial it back. You know, like don't be afraid to actively create spaciousness. And there is a difference. I was talking to someone earlier who resigned from an important position that they had driven themselves working two jobs um, to try to complete this mission that was very um, not selfish oriented, this, this position that they carried. And he stepped down and I said, look, when we step back and we say no out of not overwhelm, if we say no, like, I can't do it, I'm overwhelmed, like blah, blah, blah. We don't create any space for the universe to fill. We just create more focus on that problem. I'm overwhelmed, overwhelmed more, more of just too much energy. But when we can step back dynamically and like take a dance step and say, you know what? I'm going to say no to this task today. I'm going to say no to this position or this enterprise on my farm. It could be something really huge like a relationship. It could be something really big that's hard to say no to. It could be something really small. Like, I'm just not going to do that item on my to-do list today. I'm going to spend those 20 minutes, like, breathing instead and being with my plants and animals. When we can step back with that consciousness of knowing we're going to be supported, like, feeling that water, like you're floating in the water, and, like, the right information, people, things will come to support you. It creates a different, it creates a space for the universe to fill. An angel will step in and do that thing. The universe will work it out. Like, and if you start trying this, I think you, I've found in my experience that it is true. And it comes with who I'm being while I'm doing. Like, what kind of being am I bringing to the doing? You know, and I do get overwhelmed often. A lot of us do. I mean, who here hasn't, right? Like, <laughs> sometimes I'm in paralysis, like, haven't even started the day. And I'm like, oh my God, how is this going to happen? You know, and. In that moment, it's just like breathe, feel like you're supported by the water, remember that the universe has ways of working this out and creating new divine order that you could never even dream of from your limited story or perspective. So allow that to work. And um, that's a beautiful wave. I just thought that it's a, such a unique wave, right? Like we might not have created that in our minds, but nature and can create things in our systems that are infinite worth and are true divine potential as human beings on this planet. So getting to the practical teaching points, why is soil cover so important? Getting through the prerequisites of the energy behind this. Um, I drew this out and I'm working on this and I'm sure it's growing and evolving every day. But if you start here, and maybe there's no starting point, I don't think they are, that's why I drew, drew it as a web and not a linear graph. Even though I feel like soil cover is the foundation, carbon, soil organic matter, humus, Think about what the soil cover does. It provides protection. It provides an interface between the light and the dark, between the air and the soil, and it starts to provide a transformation of what was plant material into something new. So it's a zone of transformation and nourishment. It feeds the biology. So it, whoops. It feeds the biology to develop a more full soil food web. Anyone here not heard of the soil food web or soil biology? Anyone here want to know more about, I mean, of course, like, who doesn't want to know more about the soil food web? But um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And we go much more in detail in our, in our programs. But basically, there's to fully feed plants without us getting involved and having to rush in with the IVs or the, you know, be the 
heroes in the system. Um, nature has a way of feeding plants, and so it's not just the soil biology we think of as the food web or the microscopic, but macroscopic, which in is included in the food web. But think about our plants and roots and animals and us. Like, we're part of this. So this soil cover actually does support us. Um, it actually does nourish us and protect us and transform us. And our relationship to the soil cover can transform us. So that is needed. These microbes produce soil mineral cycling. So if you want the inorganic chemistry of your soil to be accessible to your plants, and ultimately your animals and you eating the plants, then you've got to have the soil cover to build the soil food web in biology and support the plant roots feeding the sugars to the microbes, increasing the amount of soil mineral cycling. Those microbes also create glues that build the, the structure for the air. It's like the Zen saying that the, the, it's not the bowl that's useful, it's the space inside the bowl that we use, right? It's the space inside the soil, the spaciousness in our house, in ourselves, in our cells, that will allow for interaction, life, and transformation. And the water, um, the more organic matter you have, it's in exponentially increasing your mineral cycling, but also your water storage capacity. So your soil will function in drought and flood. It will sh be able to have drainage in flood and yet retain moisture in times of drought. And we don't have very much time, given the amount of climate change, unfortunately. Even our practices that we know of building soil cover, they won't work if there's no rain. You can like soil cover on the ground, but if there's no water, then the microbes can't live and none of this can happen. So we have increasing periods of drought and flood. So we have a very, I think this is a very urgent message to work on our soil coverage. Um, also because there is hardly any fresh water on our planet, yet our soil is one of the biggest carbon sponges of filtration systems there is. It also will help our climate. We can reverse global warming and go back to pre-industrial levels of carbon if we can rebuild our soils. Even a small fraction of, if even a small percentage of the open land were treated differently. So thank you for being here. Um, and then I didn't really know what to put here as far as this word, but energetics or, you know, when the animals are smashing soil cover down, there's a kinetic energy exchange. When these minerals are cycling and the biology is reproducing, there's a kinetic energy exchange. When we're thinking or walking over our land or our intentions, our interactions, those are all producing something that may or may not, it's probably measurable, but most of us don't focus on measuring it. But there's some other quality than just biology and minerals uh, and physics, the structure, you know, and, and things. So I just kind of encompass that in this one thing. And then that makes a web where life, I call it one health, can happen with a fully functioning liquid carbon pathway and soil food web. Liquid carbon pathway is when the sun, the plants are photosynthesizing, the sun is creating through photosynthesis sugars that are being pushed out of these roots as exudates. There's some really cool videos of exudates being just replenished in the soil and these microbes gobbling up the sugar and you know building their colonies and, and their whole like marketplaces to exchange minerals and information. It's not just minerals. Information is exchanged through our microbes. Plants communicate through our microbes. When we start cutting a hay field on one side, the plants on the other side of the field start immediately responding. When a giraffe is browsing in um, plants, the other trees that aren't even connected to the one start raising their tannin levels. How is this happening? I believe it's through the fungal networks or some kind of information or kinetic energy exchange through the soil. So the more we cut soil cover, the more we can have this type of communication so that we don't have to run ourselves ragged being the doers. And we can have healthy food, we can have clean water, we can have abundant health. So this is a, you're probably familiar with this, everyone in this room, but I'm just gonna kinda go over this because a lot of people aren't, but let's just say you have a problem in your system, okay? Most of the things we consider problems are really symptoms, and it's really hard to say what's the root, 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 root cause, because it's like an onion, and you know all of these things are functioning to create the quote problem. There's no problem that's not inherently connected to this web. So whether we look at it through one window of soil minerals, or whether we look at it through another of soil biology, or whether we look at it through physics, we're looking into the same house, it's a sick system, right? So if you're having a problem, the system is sick. Your problem could be weeds, it could be insects, it could be low plant fertility, it could be disease, low quality. 
okay, if you say I'm going to spray or treat or somehow like focus on this problem as the problem, I'm going to focus my time and energy on fixing that problem. And if you choose a tool that's some kind of chemical salt or acid, that's going to kill soil life and create more compaction, less mineral cycling, it's going to tie up minerals, it's going to um, lower your fertility. So you start this downward spiral. And then your plants have lower fertility. So you're like, well, maybe I need to fertilize them. I and mean, if you choose another product that's not bio-friendly, there are plenty of things you could apply for plant fertility. And you're learning about them all through this, this weekend. And, and there's lots of information. And our mentorship programs teach them. But there's tons of things that are bio-friendly that aren't this downward spiral. But if you choose something like an herbicides or mostly salts, a lot of fertilizers or heavy salts or acid, even if they're organically, it could be organically certified. You know, if you're choosing something that kills your fungi, if you're using copper sulfate on your grapes or you're using, you know, you could be spraying something that's organically certified, but at the levels you're spraying it or the frequencies or whatever, if you're killing life, then you're starting this downward spiral. It doesn't matter if you're certified organic. Or maybe you till to um, deal with the weeds. Okay, you've killed some soil life. You've blown more carbon organic matter into the air. You're starting this, this downward spiral. Okay, and if you choose to do another thing that's doing it, then you just get more compaction because when you kill the soil life, remember we talked about they're the ones that build the structure or the house or the spaciousness for interaction and life to happen. Um, so you get more compaction, less air, more water pooling, let more anaerobic pathogens, more diseases, all these more problems happening. And then, okay, let's say you try to reseed because your crops died or your pasture died or you're like trying to throw some seed in the mixture, right? And you're like, okay, I'm just gonna replant. Well, now you get low germination or poor performance because you don't have anything to support. You don't have the habitat. So you might fertilize that. But you know, there's lots of things we can use and we, we go extensively in this in our programs, but there's lots of things that will not start this downward spiral. And eventually where we are is close to economic, ecologic, social death. You know, we've got political chaos because people are displaced, desertification super, super amounts of problems facing us now. All trying to fix a problem. So how do we manage not trying to fix a problem? Well, it's like walking down a road looking at our problem. We turn around and we say, what do I really want to create? And what's going to support that? It's a totally different direction and focus. You're looking at something different. You're not looking at the problem. You're looking at what you want to create. What are the conditions for that? Maybe it's your life. Maybe your health is suffering. What do you want to create? Not just your problem. So it's, you, we need to be aware of our problems, right? But we know that they're already part of this web. So if we try to do one thing to solve the problem, it's going to interact with all these other things and create more problems. How many people have heard of some government solution to a problem that caused more problems? Like they brought in this species to fix that one, or this bacteria to fix that one, or it never works, right? And even Bob Marley said there's no political solution. A law doesn't fix a problem, right? Well, let's make a law or a policy to fix this problem. It never works. It really doesn't. What can work is like, okay, let's, what can work is how do we create the conditions that we want to create this state of being that we want? So this is what I call the spiral of health. So health and resiliency. Okay, we start down here. We got bare soil. We got poor product. We got the same problems. Okay, let's focus on is our soil covered? And we're going to go way more into that. But... Um, Basically, and if money and time and resources and knowledge, if you have the knowledge and time and money, you can actually combine these two for even faster results we talked about earlier. But basically, if you don't have your soil covered, that's where you've got to start. Because if you can throw down the best fertilizer, the best microbes, if you don't have the habitat, nothing's going to survive. And if the water's transpiring out of your soil, it's baking, it's freezing, it's just not going to work. So then, basically, you can bait you let's just say you covered your soil with something. Maybe you spread hay. We'll talk about the different types of cover and all that. We go way into detail of that in our mentorship programs of the different things you can cover your soil with and all their different effects. But, okay, you still may have poor production and low quality. You may still have weeds and disease, but at least your soil is covered and you can stimulate or amend these. You can maybe do it at the same time. This is an, a stimulation for sure. And then you can start to get more rapid, rapid decomposition of that cover. Um, better production and quality, less diseases and weeds. And you, at a certain point, you get such rapid decomposition. Who here has ever gotten a soil where they can't keep up with the microbial life and keep their soil covered? 
that you actually have a different problem where you've got such a dynamic food web that you can't feed Seymour enough and the monsters are going, feed me, feed me, and you're growing cover crops and you're putting down like four inches of residue and like in six weeks it's gone. Like I've had that happen. You've had that <laughs> This guy, you can talk to this guy. So then there is a recycling. This is like an ascension spiral. We're kind of soaring around to the same issue from a different level. And so you, now you may need to recover your soil and may need to support it or feed it. Or, you know, there's, I can't really make it a linear diagram, but this is a concept. And eventually we can be in a, a dynamic range of health that includes resiliency and higher yield. It's not a static destination. Every breath, every day, every hour of every day, that's changing. So it's not like we get our soil healthy, we get our soil covered, and boom, our problems are fixed. I had that, who here has ever had that like, idea that they'd get healthy or they'd get their system healthy and they'd like, things would be better and all their problems would go away? I had that, I did. I, even after knowing, like you just, I slipped into it sometimes. And I keep thinking, it's like the carrot that's one step in front of your face. Oh, if I get here, I'll get here and I'll arrive. Well, it's like, well, we arrive in the moment we can only manage from the moment, and we either are creating an up, like a spiral of health or we're creating a different spiral. Or So now that we've gone into why it's so important, my second point is about how can you find your own gaps, right? How can we really dive into this? So we'll cover and blind spots. All cover is not the same. So there's a lot of concepts that I would need to cover and details that are way more than this talk. So I apologize that this is going to be very cursory and kind of rushed, but um, how does nature do it? Okay, so something happens. Anyone here live in a very dry climate? So maybe you don't see forest emerging, right? But there's some climax ecology of any system, and this depends on where you are in the brittleness scale. That's a concept that we bring in from holistic management. But in, in our area in Virginia, if we leave a field and we don't touch it, eventually it becomes forest. Um, and if you're in a really dry climate and you leave it, your soil might crust and nothing germinates, right? Have you seen that? So um, in nature, as the plants get bigger above ground, if you think about it, a tree drops a lot more leaves and carbon and organic matter than a tiny little flower, right? Or a tiny little grass that's like buried, or moss. How much organic matter does moss build a year, right? Not much, it does drop something. You see the thatch on the moss and like, but as we see things above ground, there's more and more carbon being laid down and it's a different composition of C to N ratio, carbon to nitrogen ratio. If you haven't heard of that, I can't teach all of that today, but come find me after and I can explain that more. But it's basically how woody or how, um, how much protein or nitrogen is in a system versus more lignous things or wood or like our bones are, are harder than a bacteria which is like more plasmic. So these leaves get more and more woody as in a different, like what, oops, what these trees are dropping in a hardwood forest is very different than a coniferous forest or a mixed forest or shrubs. It's very different C to N ratios, there's different compounds and so plants Nature with moisture tends to move things more fungal, and we'll show this what's happening above ground. This is kind of just a different image, but the same idea of secession, biological secession, ecological secession, is happening in our soil as, okay, we have some rock and a bird poops on it. It's very bacterial. Poop is mostly bacteria. And then, you know, maybe you get some moss, and then there's little bits of grass. The moss collects a little bit of leaves or something that blows, and then you get a little grasses, and then pretty soon you're getting some bigger grasses and maybe some bushes and, and it goes on. Well, what's happening in our soils is we're moving the types of organisms and the, and the type of soil food web that we have functioning from a very bacterially dominated system to a more fungally dominated system. So these are some numbers of biomass. If you weighed all the organisms, I think it's per gram of soil, these numbers, and this is a concept, but basically you're getting more and more biomass of bacteria, but you're getting exponentially more biomass of fungi. So the ratio between those is changing. So in one of my early concepts that I learned in biological soil building was a fungal to bacterial ratio in these different foods. And Carl uses it in his compost, how he makes 
different types of compost for different growing systems. And if you're growing, you know, oats, you're going to be needing something different than if you're growing blueberries. And you're going to be needing something different if you're growing pastures or if you're growing orchard crops. Depending on what you're growing, you may want to grow trees in your system. And I can say that soil is not homogenous, right? It functions in patches. And it can differ, like a couple inches different or a nanometer different is very different. So the idea that your field has a certain chemistry, your field has a certain biology is false. It's really like in microclimate little patches and the area around the root is like exponentially different than a nanometer away from the root or a couple or an inch away from the root because the plants are modulating the pH, they're feeding, they're creating different things. So that's why you can see moss under a blackberry bush, right? Okay, moss is over here and bushes over here. Well, where does it fall in here? Well, it's just different because where the blackberry bush's roots are is very different than the surface where the moss is covering. Um, also, if you look at it from a chemistry perspective, through the chemistry window of that house, um, different forms of nitrogen. So you've got more limited nutrient cycling on those rocks, and then you get mostly nitrate-dominated systems. And as you get more fungal and more towards forests, you get more um, different forms of nitrogen. So you get more ammonium. Not ammonia, but ammonium. And so some plants, like grasslands, some plants take up both. They like a mixed drink. Some plants like the straight moonshine. Some only like liquor or beer. at what you're putting out like you know what are you laying down what are you putting down so these are basic concepts of a secession from bare parent material like rock or whatever your parent material is in your area and then you get just mostly b um, bacteria and your fungal to bacterial ratio is very low when you're in weeds if you're interested in weeds I have a free um, training and an online once a month call that's free there's a handout in your packet it's called got weeds Go watch the training and then show up for the monthly calls. It'll go through the slides of why weeds grow and these high nitrate pulses or different types of weeds um, and how to deal with them and some case studies of what we've done to deal with weeds. So I didn't have time to go into all the weed stuff today, but um, then you start getting early grasses, mid grasses, and then you're in your late successional grasses or row crops, one to one. You start getting into vines and bushes, maybe two to one to five to one. Deciduous trees, look, you're going up to 100 to 1. Now, you have to understand the crop you're growing. Where does it grow? If you're growing strawberries, they actually grow under mature hardwood forest. So they're way more fungal. Even though they're a small plant, they're an understory plant. So you have to look at the native ecology. Where does the plant you want to grow really exist? And if you need help with that, I can help you. Other people can maybe help you. Agronomists might be able to help. Or maybe not agronomists, but ecologists might be able to help you. And so think about your fields now. Does anybody have an idea that maybe, did that give anyone here in a concept that maybe they're having some problems because they might not be putting down the type of cover that their plants need in that range? Like, does anyone have a sense that maybe something's off in your system? Like, if you're trying to grow trees and you're not, and you're, pu you're not putting down cover at all, like a lot of orchards, you see the orchards and they just spray and they're bare and, or maybe have grasses under your trees or like, is anyone thinking about, okay, I'm growing brassicas, which are probably like, well, here or here, somewhere between here and here, like they're more of an early successional plant, but yet you're, and, and, and this is overly, overly simplified because probably some of you have grown brassicas in a system where maybe you're putting some wood mulch in there or at some times a year, or you're putting that in your compost. So it, Carl, if you have something to say, please. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, well, I'm agreeing that, that this is somewhat oversimplified. Very oversimplified. Well, I've dealt with grasslands that are coming out of, I've focused mostly on transitioning from conventional. And so I've had, I do have really fertile grasslands, but we've seen fungal numbers well over 1400, 1600, uh, I need. I would love budget to do more sampling in the grasslands that we create with our management. So the bacterial number is a little anomaly where it climbs and drops as the. 
Yes. Yes. I mean, this this slide came straight from Dr. Ingham. It is dated, and I. What ends up happening, and it also happens with the pH, is as you get more and more fungal, like the pH gets buffered. So you can have a low soil pH that is a bacterially dominated soil. You can have a high soil pH that's a bacterially dominated soil, and then but the fungal acids start to buffer at about 5.5. So we. There, I'm, I'm bringing that in, it's not directly this yet, but it's a concept that I think might be applying here, which is um, different groups of organisms produce different compounds. And so I may come into a Virginia red clay soil and the soil pH is 6.2. Well, you think, well, that's still fungal, but it's not. We look at the whole soil food web and we say, oh, there's actually groups of organisms that are anaerobic, which produce acids of a pH of 2, mixing with these other ones, it's driving my soil pH down. It's not a 4.9 yet or a 2 because these are microclimates and where I sampled and everything, but it's still driving it down. Whereas a f I could have a pH of 5.5 and not be a healthy fungally dominated for a system that's buffered at 5.5. Does that make sense? And so here, um, I think, and I'm not sure, this is probably based off of Laningham's research, I'm trying, and I don't know, it wasn't precise, and PowerPoint moved a little, like, where this might be in this, in this, like, how these correlate, but there's a certain point at which the fungal foods start increasing, and there's less bacterial foods. So, like, if you're in a grassland, typically, there are grazing animals or something moving across it to keep it grassland, some kind of manures or some kind of foods, and you're also stomping down grasses, which have green leaves. We're going to get into the foods later. I have some charts of like what feeds fungi and what feeds bacteria, so we're kind of jumping ahead. But basically, if, if you've got animals stomping through an early spring pasture, that's a more nitrogen than if it's already gone to seed and you've got lots of brown stems and seed heads. And so at a certain point, when secession's happening, there's more and more woody stuff and less and less of that bacterial foods. So I think, Carl, that that might be a function of just less foods being naturally laid down um, or laid down by natural animals or, or, or management. Um, and then so you get a, a, a peak where they are more balanced, and then the fungi start jumping more, and the bacteria may have a decline. Now, whether that always happens, I don't have enough data to know. Is that yeah, no, possibly? We don't know anything about it, basically, is what he's saying. And I agree. <laughs> Having done, according to the Soil Food Web Lab, more Soil Food Web testing than anyone in the US except the lab. Like, I know you've got your own lab, so like, you're doing your own tests. But like, the more we test, the more we don't know. But I do find, what I did find was that some of the basic concepts that I'm still teaching did hold true on the testing. When we saw certain things, they were indicative <coughs> of certain plant problems, and then we were correct through our management, and, I, and it also have been shown to me by nature, like I said in the beginning. So I don't want to get into a debate about the numbers, per se, or like, I'm not, this talk, the scope is not really about these numbers, but it, I really want you to understand that all soil cover is not equal. What you're stomping down, or rolling down, or mowing down, or however you're putting cover down is different. and. I really want you to start thinking about the timings and the patternings of those strategies of applying soil cover and when do you need to boost your litter layer so that you can have the nature do what it's going to do. And then we can study it. Like then it becomes easier to study, like you're saying, in a healthy grassland system. Like when we can get that healthy grassland system, we can study it. Now, I would love to study it every step along the way. I ran out of money, basically, um, and so I've done a lot of the, continued a lot of the production that I learned through the intensive years of studying, and I don't have the funding yet to keep studying what I'm doing, but I'm hoping that someone would love, like some university, just come study what we're doing on our farms and focus on the farm. I'm trying to get the government to see a strategy that they could focus their research on good farmers and not just on chemically farmed research farms and maybe learn something about soil health. So. Um, I agree that we don't know, but for basic premises, I can, within the constraints that there are microclimates, like I'm sure that if we tested the root of that blackberry and then we tested the soil surface where the moss is growing under it, those would be two different ratios. And I started doing some of that, even in our um, poly, perennial polycultures, I started testing if I had a, 
oats and orchard grass and clovers, I started testing the root systems of the different plants as well as the plant tissues of the different plants as well, you know, as well as a general soil chemistry core just to see. And all I can say is they're very different. Like in the same square foot, the oat that's growing is going to show you that you need to apply a different foliar spray if you do a, a tissue test than a, and I know that's not a sap analysis, but I only had the tissue tests available to me at that moment. The tissue tests are like two weeks old or a little bit older data because by the time the plant has built the leaf, the sap is like the blood, the blood of the plant, what's happening now as far as nutrient deficiencies. And we teach more about that in our programs, but basically the, the, the what we're learning is that these plants are doing different things, they're in different microclimates, and so these rules may be true, but in very small distances, right? And they're, what's possible, like I worked with Will Allen and we put a very fungal, he was putting very fungal, sorry, he was putting vermicompost, which we tested um, as more bacterially dominated on fungal plants like tomatoes, and he was, he did still have some production problems. They weren't the best tomatoes. Like he was growing with urban compost in really urban environments, you know, on top of wood mulch. And so we started trying to figure out like, okay, if you put down a balanced compost, then the plant theoretically can, my, can feed, can the plant manage its own ecology? And I believe, yes, it does. So now we're getting way down the rabbit hole. Who here is lost? Like anybody like this is, or is, or is this more interesting to you? Like, is this level of discussion interesting? Just give me a pulse check. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So, um, in a very oversimplified way, nature's moving more fungal in this humid climate. There's a lot of qualifiers, see? And then it's the idea is that in whatever microclimate it is, it could be a nanometer, there are different pHs, different biological soil food webs, different things happening. Um, different forms of nitrogen and it's all determined a lot of it is determined off the plant but if we don't have soil cover we can't support any of this happening so that's why I focus my talk on soil cover I did want to just show this idea and then like disturbances happen right we come in and till or a flood happens or this is not just a one-way flow a fire happens or you know, there's lots and lots of things that happen to keep these ranges, it's always moving one way or another. It's kind of like that spiral. It's never just one way, or it's never static, and it's never homogenous. But this is a concept that as, you know, you come through larger and larger plants, more biomass above ground, different foods, different C to N ratios above ground, falling on the soil surface, or somehow being trampled by animals, or somehow getting back to the soil surface, through a natural senescence or deciduous cycle somehow, basically with moisture, you get some change below ground. And so, this is a, <laughs> I don't want to, this is not, I mean, where are your fields now? We just talked about your field isn't in one place or the other, but if you could think about like, okay, um, I'm trying to grow trees and I don't have any soil cover, I don't have any of these foods coming down and my trees are having a disease or an insect, could it be possible that the diseases only come to wipe out sick trees? Who here believes that? Yeah. Like diseases would only wipe out a sick plant. <laughs> or, or more susceptible. More susceptible, yeah. yeah, more infection sites maybe, less immune, less minerals to make immune compounds with, less lipid fatty acid layers. Is that, I don't know, it, anybody, believe that that might be true, that obviously we need to learn more about it, but maybe that's a concept we could explore, would be interesting to explore. I, I, I believe that because I don't see maggots on my healthy animals, my cows. Maggots don't come and lay eggs on my healthy cows until they're pretty much dying. And yeah, so I worked extensively. I managed 40,000 acres of land and 23,000 acres of hindwood, hardwood and 8,000 acres of pine. We had pine beetle, right, in Virginia. It's, people kept saying, you sound like Mad Jack. And it was like, who's Mad Jack? Well, Mad Jack was someone that worked at Virginia Tech. He's gone now. But he proved before Tech took money from the chemical, funding from the chemical companies, he was proving that the beetles aren't killing the trees, that it's the forestry management that was killing the trees, and there were three or four sets of fungi killing the trees and eating the dead tree, basically, and then the beetles eating the fungi. And so he did that, and they fired him. And um, that's a concept that 
I think we could explore more. Honestly, I believe that the, you know, whether it's Wi-Fi, radionics, jet fuels, all the chemicals in our rain. I mean, our, when I walk through our forest compared to memories of when I was young, 30, you know, 30 years ago or more, um, I'm almost 40. So I remember forests that were slightly different in my area. And I get messages from the trees everywhere. I've gone around the planet that like, our forests are really sick for whatever reason, right? There's all sorts of reasons. They talk to, I, I'm going to say it, we're here at VFA, like, it's on recording. I, I don't think I'm making it up, and I do feel like there's a lot of factors. I can't say what it is. The important thing is, what can, what can we control in our decision making to change that? And there are a lot of things, you know, I wish I could take away some of these waves that my body's exposed to every day that I feel in my body aren't good for me, like Wi-Fi's and 4G's and 5G's and, you know, um, but I can't protect, you know, the whole planet, at least physically. Um, I do believe my thoughts and prayers matter, and there are things within my sphere of control on my farm and within our forest lands that I can try to help build resiliency so that the trees might be more resilient in these adverse systems. Um, so let's go into, I'm developing this more fully and I do have a lot of images. Yeah. Oh, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, no, I'm just interested in this. Little okay, you're like, get to the point. Okay, so <laughs> basically I'm developing this. I have a lot of images. I was having some technical difficulties with some of the images, but what I'm going to do is go through some stages that I'm identifying and these are our these are lines in the sand <laughs> that I've drawn. Um, maybe somebody else is teaching them, but it's emerging. It's something I'm trying to teach a concept. And okay, maybe have some fully bare soil. When I thought about all the people in our programs and mentorship programs and things I've seen or managed or healed land that is pretty fully bare, it's either been like burned. Um, there's a lot of wildfires going on. A lot of people in our programs in Canada, California, what they're having their lands burned. So, and I've done controlled burning, so you can have like low temperature burning, high temperature burning. There's a lot of factors, a lot of things around burning. Um, we could develop whole training on just burned land and how to bring it back depending on the situation and what tools you have. Maybe it's been pugged to mud, like, okay, it rained, the animals like got all trot up, and, or maybe you had a festival of music and you had like 3,000 people on your farm and you got mud. Okay, so somehow it's pugged mud by some kind of animal, like flew to humans as animals. And so, or cars <laughs> could be tracked up by four-wheelers or trucks or whatever. But um, that may be more over here. But I was just trying to think of the ways that soil gets bare. Okay, maybe it's eroded. There was some disturbance and then now it's eroded and you've basically lost your topsoil. That's kind of a different place than if you have topsoil and you, you know, but let's say you've lost some feet of soil or you've lost some inches of soil and you're down to that like kind of B horizon, more inorganic type, not very humic stuff, like that's going to be a lot more challenging, right? And the techniques and strategies and tools we would apply would be slightly different there. Maybe you just drove a bulldozer and built a swale. We just did this on our farms, built more swales and ponds. Okay, we're trying to establish cover when we've scraped off the top layer and we try to save the topsoil and put it back on, but it takes some time. Um, maybe you tilled in your garden. It's freshly bare soil. Maybe you tilled on thousands of acres. Um, maybe you cleared forest. Whatever it is, like it could be freshly bare or partially bare, um, depending on how much they left of the forest. Um, maybe there was a flood that either suffocated your plants and they're all dead and your soil's bare, or maybe you got three feet of soil or ten feet of soil. I've seen this this year. I survived a 50-inch rainfall in 24 hours. That's not pretty. Um, Talk about soil being dumped. Well, now we have a whole new layer of soil, and we're starting over, right? You've got a hilly farm. You've seen, you've done this. I've been to, you should all go to his farm, every single one of you. If you do nothing else, go to Carl's farm in Vermont, Vermont Composting Company. Um, so, <laughs> drought, right? Could kill everything. You got bare soil. So there, I just called it stage one. It's bare. Okay. Anybody here got that? I mean, I have that on some areas of my farm, right? I try not to have it ever, but it happens. So um, is, now I'm just going through some images because I couldn't relate all the images to the stages, but this was our farm. Um, when the farmer, the last year before I got onto the farm, when a farmer was growing soybeans conventional and had sprayed. And um, so I think it was soybean, I'm trying to think. 
I'll have, yeah, I'll have to look at what year this was, but I think this was, this might have been us, because it has cover. I don't think he had this much cover. But does this soil look covered? It's armor. It's what? That's why the soil armor is for protection, but it's not a lot. Not a lot. Here's inside. Look at all the bare soil. So you have to get out of your truck. You have to walk into your fields and look down, which is like really important. We try to get people in our programs, if you're going to send me a picture of soil, give me the overview, like let me see the land and what's going on, and then let me see straight down. That's not even straight down, but you can see. I think I was in the truck riding by or something, but usually you have to get out of the truck. If you can see bare soil from your truck, it's really bad. So um, this might be stage two. I think these pictures are a little out, but partially bare, right? Mostly bare. Like I would just say this is bare, bare. But now I'm realizing that, okay, here's some more. Like this was our farm in a mother fields when there's nothing but henbit growing after chemically nuked for 11 years and soybeans and... You know, this is what I had when I came with my grass, my cattle. This was the grass I had to graze, like, and the mud. So, okay, starting from that. And then this is under a vine. I wrote that on the chart. Hold on, let's go back. Oh, I put, I got these out of order because it's on stage two. But under vines, this is an invasive, an invasive vine that came in in some hay, and it covered about five acres of land, and it is called hops, and it, what I noticed was it really improved the soil, and some little critter that poops like that really liked the seeds. So we had bare soil that I could now stick my hand into this red clay from this invasive vine that most people would have tried to spray an herbicide or prevent. I observed what was actually happening, like dig up your plant roots, get out there. Um, how, how much time do we have, Evan? Okay, so maybe it wasn't the grassland that I wanted and my cattle, it's really sticky to walk through and it gets about this tall and like you're getting ripped by this like, it's almost like stinging nettle and, but look at what it's doing for my soil. I actually took samples of that to my lab and I asked the state cattle vet, is it gonna be bad for my cattle if I unroll hay and feed my cattle on all this mouse poop? And they're like, we can't think of anything that's like problem with that. So we unrolled hay bales and did a hay feeding program on it and covered it, you know, so but the soil itself, I, don't, I have lots of pictures, and I'm going to put more pictures in, but you could just literally put your hand in it, whereas the rest of my farm's like, like working on clay. So this vine, so really pay attention. So now I'm thinking about, okay, we could grow. Um, now it's, it's an opportunity, right? Instead of seeing the problem, I'm seeing permaculture says, see your problem as your opportunity. I've got five acres of this land. I'm like, oh, they're doing um, hemp trials for grazing. Oh, I... This has killed my sod on five acres, and hemp would compete with this vine it's a, or some kind of tall, bushy cover crop that really aggressively grows fast, you know, and here I have, I didn't need to till to kill five acres of land. I didn't need to put chemicals to kill five acres of land, you know, which I wouldn't do anyway now where I am now in my thinking, but, you know, here's a problem, here's an opportunity, right, that I have an opportunity where I could do some cropping trials or some research trials or I can plant things that compete with this vine or, or there's an opportunity to grow things that are cool season because the vine is a summer annual vine so I could grow amazing cool season crops right I could grow a field of rye and harvest it for ourselves I could grow hops it's a is it a true hop it look it looks and smells like marijuana the buds I had some in a I wrapped some in tin foil and I was carrying my car and I was moving hay like 40 miles and I was like and I had the seeds and I, they look just like pot seeds like with the tiger stripes and everything and I was like oh if I get pulled over how am I going to explain this to the officer like this is a weed on my farm like this is not marijuana so anyway but it it doesn't grow like marijuana like the plant itself doesn't but it's a vine but it the seeds look like and it is like I think probably a five lobe leaf I've got some pictures of it if you're interested. So anyway, the, the point is that you might have bare soil from things that are outside your control or in your control, and you have to learn. So then those were more like, most of those were stage two. I, I got those a little mixed up. But um, let's just say you overgrazed, okay? Maybe you have partial cover, but you've got bare spots between the plants. Or like we planted a bunch of orchard grass, so I had bare soil in between my plants. Even though I had big, robust orchard grass plants, there were still opportunities for soil cover. So that's what I'm saying. And you're, who here can think of an opportunity in between your plants, or under your tomatoes, in between your plants, that you don't have soil coverage that you could have? Anybody? Yeah. So I started like mulching under my tomatoes or seeding things under my tomatoes while they're, before they're like starting to defoliate. 
Maybe you have too thin of crop residues left over, or maybe your planting density is really low. I learned from Will Allen, I just do my greens, I broadcast them. I just have beds full of greens and we just cut them every week. I don't do the two by two, you know, it saves me time. I'm just like, you know, and it's a little extra seed, but my soil's covered. So canopy closure, what is that? That is if you're looking from a raindrop and you're falling on the soil, are you going to hit soil or are you going to hit a leaf? And that's a very important stage to hit. When you get to canopy closure, you're starting to get somewhere. You don't have your litter layer built down below necessarily. Like, um, so we haven't gotten to canopy closure here. Who here has areas where they don't have full, can full canopy closure over their soil? Yeah, so that's a, you can focus on growing more stuff to get canopy closure, that gives you more stuff to lay down that you don't have to truck in to bring to get soil close. Like I love covering soil with stuff that grew there because I don't have to move it there, right? Like it's already there and nature will do it and the snow will do it or like I will do it or the animals can do it or like there's lots of ways once you're growing stuff. So it's hard when you're in stage one to get something growing so that you can get canopy closure and you can put down mulches, right? Like that's one of the hardest places and that's a great place to join an implementation program if you're having that struggle. But even if you're um, partially bare, we could think of ways to try to intercede or you know, maybe you're growing trees but you can grow other crops under your tree or like there's lots of ways to get canopy closure. Who here has not seen the NRCS rainfall simulation video? Anybody? Okay. Um, I will send a link out to one we did on our farm. It's, it changes your life. I don't have time to play it here, but it shows you why this is so important. It takes the same soil, shows different management, um, and it takes, you really will see why our rivers are polluted, why our oceans are polluted, why we have dead zones, why it goes on and on problems with human health and our drinking water and all this stuff. Like it visually changes your life. So I really, suggest when we send that email out um, to watch that. And um, what else can we talk about here? So just, you know, let's just say you planted something in that bare soil and you don't have enough plants. You just don't have, they're not fertile enough, right? That's where maybe when you plant, we could do a seed inoculant to boost that it maybe has minerals and microbes and a chelator or something in it you can mix on the seed, something you can multi, in permaculture, we love to take one use of energy and multi-purpose that. So um, in that case, you'd be doing the planting anyway. Mixing the seed inoculant is a little extra energy, so it's not just one use of energy, but, and it is an extra cost. So we have to look at costs. We have to look at returns in your system, and every system is different as to what you would do. But there may be ways we could boost that so that at least you're, what I'm really good at, at least sometimes, most of the time, is getting a cover crop. Like one of the biggest mistakes I write is people don't treat their cover crop, their initial thing they're trying to seed as a cash crop. Like if you're coming into bare soil, that's the time to give it everything you got in, in your first attempt or unless you know you have really fertile soil and everything's going to grow, you put seed down. But like that's the time, even if it's not your cash crop, to treat it well. Um, even though people say it's just my cover crop, if you don't get a good enough germination and good enough canopy closure, you're not going to have any carbon to lay down. Your cash crop's not going to be very good. You're going to have to go into another cover crop cycle or lose your cash crop. So if you, to six months prior, put some energy into that cover crop, maybe you don't immediately throw the book at it, but you watch the germination, and we teach the leaf stages and watching that, and you see early on if you need to do something to help that cover crop. So there's lots of yield determining windows. And so we teach all that in our mentorship programs because it's too much for here, but we really want to help get that bare soil into this stage, or ideally, we like to skip this stage and go right into stage three, which gets canopy clover. But you may not have your litter layer. Now, litter, soil litter is what's on the soil surface. When you dig on your soil surface, you should see things that look like dead plant material or living plant, some kind of plant material. And then as you dig through that a little more, like I love to get people out in their fields and like really explore, okay, now I see leaves and stems, and now I see like partially digested leaves and stems, and now I see some little like mushy stuff, and like you should actually see a transition, a smooth transition. If you see your crop residues, and then it's just soil, and there's nothing breaking down, nothing, and you're walking across and it's going crunch, 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 your nutrients are oxidizing. It's still helping the raindrops not compact your soil. It's still helping insulate your soil, but it's showing you that maybe you have a litter layer that isn't decomposing. So 
here we get um, canopy closure if we can get a cover crop after the first disturbance or bare. Um, sometimes you get a white clover in a pasture that's been overgrazed or trampled at the gate. The white clover will come back, again, a canopy, and it'll have canopy closure, but there's not a lot of litter layer under that. So that's a pasture. This is supposed to be about grazing animals and crops, so I'm including examples from both. But Or maybe you have um, some early successional grasses, like you have crabgrass creeping across a bare area, but there's not a lot of litter there. Uh, that was accidentally left on the slide. Sorry. Just ignore that. And then if we can get to a canopy closure and then we start building our litter layer, there's even stages of that. So we start over here with you got maybe some litter, but you got holes in your litter. Who here has rolled down a, a rye or some kind of cereal grain cover crop? Have you ever noticed that sometimes it's really thick in the beginning, but as it starts to digest or maybe had some other things mixed in with it, you see the stems, but there's air getting through to your soil. That will grow germinate weeds more. Like you already, that needs, even before that happens, ideally we want to prevent that from happening. Ideally, I might, it's my current understanding. Again, this is always evolving, I'm always learning. But if I can, and sometimes you can't because you've got this crop and you're waiting to harvest it and you're on a large scale and you can't, there's no way you're going to cover that. Maybe you could over, like there are ways of aerial seeding or, or interseeding or like there's lots of things we could explore with our larger scale growers. But you know, if you've got uh, a small scale thing, you probably can think of something that you can do. And even if it's just you're in your garden and you can like chop and drop some weeds right there, you're weeding anyway. Maybe you don't have to dig out the roots. And we talk about that in our weeds program. Sometimes we leave the roots because they have a function as they're dying, decomposing, and we just chop and drop them. Or, you know, there's lots of things we can do to try to fill in those holes or get the litter layer thicker, but basically then, let's say you get a thick litter layer, maybe you roll down a big cover crop and you got four inches of litter, but you're not seeing it decompose very fast. That may seem like a good thing because you're like, oh, less work for me, I don't have to cover my soil, but it is less nutrients going back into cycle. So we really want to start seeing the thicker layer, layer actively decomposing, form as hum forming humus layer feeding microbes. Dig in there you'll start to see that transition zone. Even under the snow, I just did in our programs, I had people that we were supposed to do, they were showing me a pasture walk on their pastures, and they both, like, one was in Iowa, one was in Pennsylvania, they're like, it's snowing, we can't do a pasture walk. And I'm like, it's covered in snow, what are we gonna learn? I'm like, no, nah. I was like, if you can go out there, we're gonna learn, because there's a video on our, check out our videos page on simplesoilsolutions.com. Some of the soil most rapidly builds under the snow. And so we dug under the snow, and we saw holes in their litter layer, where the snow is actually protecting, in climates where the snow stays all winter, that's really great. It can protect the soil until you can get something on there, but like under that snow, things can rapidly go away. Your litter layer you had under the snow may not be there when the snow disappears. Ideally, if you have this rapid decomposition, you might find, we found earthworms, we found germination under the snow in one of our videos on our webpage. Germinating plants, it's ice pelleting on me, and I'm so cold I can barely talk or like hold things. I'm trying to make it look like everything's good, nice, but like things are happening because the, that litter layer, remember about the protection, it's the more biological activity you have, the more heat coming out of your soil. Who here's noticed when the snow melts, it melts around the, the active plants first or where you have more cover first? So it's because there's like a lot of biological activity and the plants respiring and like there's all this sex and reproduction going on, it creates a little heat. Um, a lot of biological functions going on which create heat and so you get more insulation in the winter as well as in the summer we found there's also videos showing orchard grass which is supposed to cut off when the temperatures get above 80 actively growing when it's been 90 degrees and hot dry winds for weeks and no rain like in droughts we give orchard grass plants like this tall with leaves and regrowing after grazing and but if you study that plant, they're not supposed to be functioning when the temperatures are 100 degrees for weeks. They're supposed to have shut down their enzymatic system. What's happening? Well, our video shows that there's a soil cover, so the soil's not 80 degrees. Your soil probably should never be 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So that protection is really important from a temperature point of view, from a water compaction, wind, you know, all these different, to protect, this whole party that's going on with all these mixed drinks and moonshines and reproduction that you want to have happening in your soil so that your plants are fertilized. Um, 
So then, okay, we've got a thicker litter layer, we've got some canopy closure, but really when you start getting into more of the work, the more multi-story canopy and different leaf shapes and angles and sizes, the more you're gonna be capturing um, photosynthesis. So here, here we're working on the soil food web and we're also still working on the soil food web here, but we're really working on the liquid carbon pathway here for like how efficient, how much photosynthesis can you get off of one square foot of soil? Because that plants are gonna be pumping different types of sugar than your residues. So you've got your litter providing a certain amount of foods. And if you think about it, the litter layer on top mostly feeds the fungi because it does feed bacteria, especially if you have animals or you have some way of incorporating a little bit into the soil surface. But fungi can grow their hypha up and they have enzymes and they can digest the soil surface and they can bring that residue down. A bacteria is so small that it has to have like plant matter that's into the soil. Like a, to move an inch for a bacteria in a lifetime, they have to swim, first of all, it should just be water, kind of swim around. and. They're not gonna jump over like to the soil surface. They have to eat what's, there are some bacteria on the soil surface and there's bacteria already on those plant surfaces that will help digest them. There are, um, like our skin and plants should be covered in healthy bacteria and fungi. And when the more healthy your soil is, as the plant grows out from the seed, it's covered more in these natural um, organisms. And I've done biological leaf testing too to see how the leaf layer is being affected of the these organisms prevent infection. So when you start working over here with multi-story canopies and different leaf shapes and sizes, as the sun angles change, you know, yes, you've got these larger players at the top, but then you have the little understory plants that are catching little bits of sunlight that are, so you get even more liquid carbon and different forms of cakes and cookies, more diversity in your soil. It just starts flowing into the soil food web and then any kind of germinating plant out of it this litter layer is also really important for plant germination because if you can get, when, in our pastures, when we get tromped down litter layer, suddenly we don't have to add seed. The seed is already there. We have seed germinating. So we want that germination. We don't want to have to buy seed and, and seed our pastures to get diversity. So when we start managing this, what we're putting down and the timing and the patterning and the foods and whether the grass is, you know, it's going to vary one of the things I teach if you want year-round grazing and diversity of species in your pasture, if you're on a perennial system, we want to move our animals through at different times of year. A lot of people get stuck in a rotation. Who here has animals? Anybody? Okay. Who here is interested in creating more diversity or year-round production in their fields naturally? Okay, so think about it this way. It comes back to that slide in the beginning of the prerequisites of not only the tool but the strategy of using the tool and the timing and the patterning. So if we trample with animals in the winter, and then come the early spring, we've got that cover layer, we fed some hay, we unrolled, and we've trampled down plants, and the snows buckled them down, and we've added some manure, we've added urine, we've added milk foam, we've added saliva, we've added bacterial foods. We're gonna get into that quickly, but we've basically covered this soil, we fed it. If we do that in March or February, and then through the green up period, we have those foods decomposing, it's very different than if we do it in the spring or we do it in July or August when everything is like really woody and weeds and different types of foods we're stomping down or it's really different than if we did it the fall before like in December that those materials had more time to decompose come spring green up there's a whole different chemistry biology going on food web so if you want diversity vary your pattern we vary the size and shape of our paddocks. We vary the type of animals we're putting on. We vary the timing we're putting them on and how much we graze to trample, how much we take and how much we put back and what we're putting back. And you start doing that and that's when you get so much diversity. We have gamma grass showing up, all eastern gamma grass, all over our property. I've never seeded it. It's, an, it's a native warm season annual that people try to establish and can't get to germinate well, it's in our seed bank, right? It's already there. So if you start focusing on these stages, um, this is just like our horses, but you know, this is just showing there's some Johnson grass in here that's a summer annual. There's orchard grass, there's perennial ryegrass, there's clovers, there's some weeds, there's all sorts of stuff being mashed down. And this is just with three horses. Like I've done this work with lot, you know, 
250 animals in a herd, I've done it with three. Like you can do it, you might not get uniform stomping, but I think they had just turned the horses out and they roll a little or like you start feeding the microbes, smashing down. We try to graze 10 to 30% of the top, which is better for the animal. And we try to give back the rest as much as possible without limiting the animals. And that's like a rule of thumb in our grazing programs, but it starts to create more diversity. So um, anybody have an idea about what stage of cover? Just call it out, like where you're, you know, stage one, two, or three, uh, the majority of your farm or your fields where you want to focus on? Two, three. And where in three? Like more on this side or more on this side? It's hard, I was trying to think about this with, you know, multi, the cover crop mixtures and things in an you know, annual cropping system. Are you in crops or well, grazing? I, yeah, I'm from New Zealand, so we, we graze 24 7, 12 months a year. Yeah. So you're not, are you doing crops too? Where you're crops, yeah. So even in our cropping, like I was really trying to figure out a 12 species mixture of grains that I could grow and have sprouted grain bread or without separating them. But I hadn't figured that out yet because they all come to maturity at different times and things. But I can, f it's much easier with the animals because they can harvest it and, and it's less complicated than with all the machines. So that's why I began with the grazers because it's, it's the easiest thing. You got fence, you got animals, you can begin. You know, with cropping, you've got to deal with maybe getting different equipment and different rotations and things. So um, there are times if your soil is too wet, you got 900 cows, like you may have to choose certain areas of your farm that drain the best out of the firmest soil. And like, on, you know, you may have to kind of, I teach what I call sacrifice strategies that I call your feed your soil strategy. So it, we can, it depends on your level of inputs and like budget, but like, do you feed hay at all? Okay, okay. So um, it's harder, he's feeding a fermented food, which we have unrolled on the soil and seen sometimes can take the grass away temporarily. It does seem to improve the soil in the long term, but it can burn the grass with the ferments. So um, it's harder to put that carbon down on the soil um, directly other than through the manure, but sometimes you have to choose to sacrifice an area of your farm, but if what we try to teach our methods that that sacrifice area, instead of a traditional sacrifice strategy where it just gets torn up, actually our sacrifice areas become our best production areas later, there are ha certain amounts of rainfall that, that can't happen. And if you don't have hay, so sometimes for us it's wetter in the winter or like we can unroll some dry hay and then that the animals are smashing some carbon in and so they're we try to unroll it before we put them in there so we can at least some of the bases of the plants might be saved. Even if it looks pugged, there might be some bases of plants. And then we've, so there's a lot of, there's heavy, heavy moisture with a lot of animals is one of the toughest situations. Um, it has that. It's you. like a cow herd. Yeah. If you had a cow herd, they're the roller crimpers that we use because they've got the cloven feet. Equines do some, but not as much with their feet. And like, if you can crimp the plant, like if we go to this picture, I have some better pictures that show it, but a lot of the plants are just bruised. If you go, they're still attached to this, they're still photosynthesizing, the solar panel's just flat. So he's talking about the recovery from mowing it off. If you mow it off, it's got to go down and then be digested and turn back into energy of the plant. It's a lot longer cycle of decomposition, <laughs> whereas if some of the leaves may die and some of the plants may die, if you stomp them or roll or crimp them, but for a little while, like if it's an annual, you've crimped like an annual cover crop, it will die, but it will still be somewhat photosynthesizing as it's dying and it still has the roots. And like if you're crimping your pastures by trampling or somehow putting this, trampling it down, some of those leaves are bacterial foods, some of them are fungal foods. And I do want to switch to those. Um, so let's, let's go into this, what can you do right now? We talk about helping a dynamic, we're going to get into the foods, dynamic range, not a static destination. So um, health is not where you arrive. You're healthy if you stay on track, but you're not a healthy, it's not just like you arrive and you're there. So life is kind of weaving you curves, the climate, all these things, and we're trying to navigate within a range of health. Let's say you put compost down and it did really well, and then you, I don't know, or lime or something, and it did, moved your system more into range. If you keep doing that same tool over and over, if you keep steering right, you're gonna steer it off the road for your plant. Like maybe you're moving the system more fungal and I have moved like turf grass systems to fungal um, with the Ramiel wood. Like are you seeing the grasses come up? Are they more in like 
gate areas and lanes and. Um, well, what we're seeing a lot of different. I mean, it, 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 there's so many different effects going on. Because we've one of the things we've seen is that as we've changed water flows on the farm, and um, that we're seeing we, the species changes from the effluents that because we mobilize a lot of particulate. Yeah. And so we're using pasture down gradient of our of our compost making a lot. And we've turned the water a lot flatter, so we've got at this point. He's put kind of like swells and things to yeah. slow down the water, and that's a huge piece and, of this. So One of the things I wanted to ask, and it might be hard if you don't have as much sunshine, you sh on the plant success checklist, we talk about the leaf shape and appearance, and we teach a whole thing in our programs about different things you look in leaf shapes and sizes and, and shininess to see if the plant is actually at its at its more optimal stages of health or if it's a little more stressed. But if it doesn't have enough sunshine, the leaves will be kind of more dull, not shiny, waxy. Those shine on the grass is extra stored energy as fat and it's fatty acids and the, the animals will perform better with less diarrhea. We go into the gut of the animal eating the plant and the pH of the animal and immune system function and how that all starts to connect to what we're doing on the soil in the, in the actual practices. But pretty much there might be some things you could do with swales because even, even on a flat area land, there's no land that's completely flat and actually gradual slopes still work really well with the water to try to hydrate deeper so you're, you're getting less and then have maybe different kind of drainage when it's too wet. Because um, the more, he's right, the more you can build the soil structure, it can handle weight, more weight without breaking down um, the more we can build this litter layer and robust species of plants, maybe with tougher, maybe in certain wintering areas or where it's wet, whenever the wettest season, and we, we look for grasses that have more robust thatch layers and, and tufts of like, so that if they do get destroyed, there's a part of the bunch that can regenerate. You know, um, th I think there's a lot of things we could still look at in your system to keep going in the direction you want to go, even though you're doing um, probably amazing work. It's like, it seems like the rabbit hole never ends in a system of like how to improve. So we got two minutes. Okay, so we go through this a little more in our programs, but there is a disturbances chart. It goes through some things that are usually harmful, sometimes could be positive, negative, depending on how they're used, that strategy, timing, and technique. And then there's things that are usually positive. There are positive disturbances, like our animals coming through or that crimper can be a positive disturbance to a system. Or, and I don't even want to say positive, negative, because it just it is turning it in one direction or the other. Um, but this habitat part is what we're really working on, creating the habitat for life with that soil cover, which does feed biology. Soil organisms eat organic. They eat that soil organic matter. They eat that carbon coming out of the roots. You know, they eat that stuff on top. So you're feeding it. Um, when we come into a system, if these aren't there, these top three, um, we try to figure out feeding biology the cheapest way without buying an input or bringing a truck across or a piece of equipment across the land. Sometimes we do feed biology because there's generally some biology there talking about species like when we've come into fields that have you know 150, 250 way below the normal or needed biomasses of organisms when we start creating habitat for their survival and giving them foods through the changing of the management. Maybe stop over grazing and start stomping down more residual. Maybe mow a little higher. Maybe leave a little more before winter. Like we start the populations start increasing and the diversity starts increasing and the different hyphal diameters like on its own and you can add biology you can add compost there's and so i've got some slides here and you will get them if you sign up the rest of the foods and things but there's a lot of ways to add biology and if you think about it even hay you're bringing in or things like it has biology on it any kind of food waste any kind you know any kind of plant material you're also adding biology it doesn't mean you have to buy it in a bottle so there's creative thinking around this. And then only if the plant is still suffering and needs an IV, like if they're showing sign, if you've got a cash crop you can't lose and you have the money and time and knowledge, you can do a sap test or tissue test and, and feed the plant an IV and save a crop. Like it's something that we do a lot. And, but it's not the most efficient use of your energy, right? Like, so if you're doing this and spending a lot of money feeding your plants, but you're still harmfully disturbing, or you're feeding them with things that are disturbing them, or you don't have the habitat and cover, you're wasting time and money, right? So that's where we do teach workshops, three-day workshops on all the different ways you can feed plants and add biology, and you know we teach all that, but 
I don't want to, I teach you when you don't need it, right? Like that's in my best interest so you can spend more time enjoying your farm. Um, and then like last, if it was, like there have been times when we've approached it like we need to kill a plant or pathogen because it's killing our trees that we can't, they're 40 year old trees. And then we come and figure out, okay, let's work on the basics again. Like if you do something, even if it's organic to kill pests or pathogens, don't just spray copper sulfate every two weeks. Like come back and fix the base of the food chain. So um, these are some of the NRCS soil health principles. And we're very much in alignment with that, this diversity, diversity of management styles. This soil cover piece is so important. So if you haven't got that piece, really focus on that. This is critical also, but the more soil cover you have, if you do have harmful residues of any kind of past chemicals or anything, the more carbon you have, the more organisms you have, the faster it will bioremediate, phytoremediate that, those chemical residues. So um, we talk about, these, these are just, ways you can add biology, and I could add in here hay or any kind of plants you're adding in the system, any kind of wood, you're adding biology. Now what kinds of biology? You don't know. Even if you bring in topsoil, you're bringing in biology. I've had people bring in topsoil, plant all their carrots in their, hoop, in their greenhouse, and then they brought in root feeding nematodes. You know, like, so there are times when we do recommend a test, but for the most part, we just try feeding them and seeing if things respond or we add things that we know. Like if you're gonna put compost down, I would recommend testing it. It's a lot of energy to put compost down. You can buy really expensive compost as crawl nodes that won't do the job. It will actually could harm your plant. So the proof is in the pudding, but sometimes it's too expensive to lose your plants and it's worth the cost of a test. Sometimes you're on a certain scale, you can throw a little out, see how your plants respond, let them be the living laboratory, and you don't need to send a test to a lab. So if you're interested in whether you do need testing or not, whether it's of your soil or plants or animals or some type, we, we teach all that in our programs. I'm happy to have a conversation with you. Um, feeding biology, it's better to use your waste in the place that they are produced than to move them around. So do what's free first. If our animals can trample grass and they can put manure and saliva and milk from when they lie down and ruminate anyway, and we can move them around, it's way easier than us trucking their poop out of the barn and spreading it with spreaders, right? So the more we can think about waste, um, more than purchase inputs, it's usually better. Uh, for our economic and energy use. And then cover crops are great ways, and <coughs> grazing cover crops is even better, you know, way, or roller crimping if you have to, but grazing those cover crops, I have a lot of pictures of that and examples of killing cover crops with animals, and then you're actually doing, I've seen even better results using the animals in the cover crops if it's not too wet or the, your NOAA skilled grazer is moving them around. So you can destroy soil with animals really fast too. So. Um, as you know, <laughs> one hour in a rainstorm with 900 cows and you've got a bloody muddy mess, right? Like, and it's very frustrating because now you've gone back to stage one. You, you now, like you, you did it, what is it in Monopoly? You go back to go and you don't collect your $200 and it actually cost you another grand or something. But pretty much when you go back to bare soil in your system, you're doing that to yourself. And sometimes it will happen. Like, it will happen, even when you're a great manager. It happens, you know? <laughs> so um, we can feed them minerals. M microbes can't grow without minerals. So if they're limited in your soil pool, they're not cycling yet, for whatever reason, you won't get good microbial growth, right? So it used to be, when I first started learning about microbes, it was like, oh, microbes, microbes, microbes. But it's like, well, micro minerals make the world go around. They make all the enzymes run. So sometimes a little mineral chelator or a tiny bit of minerals in biofriendly forms really help the microbial community, right? Like, and that's where sometimes feeding the plants can feed these sugars and really help the microbial community. So there are times to feed plants. Um, and this is what we're really talking about a lot is number five, this carbon, this source form placement and timing. Depends on which group it feeds. I don't have time to get into all these other things, but Basically, here's some examples of bacteria foods. Anything with high nitrogen content. Generally, they say brown stuff feeds fungi, but coffee grounds are brown and they feed bacteria. Or a high nitrogen tree, a leguminous tree, you might be getting wood, but if it's from a leguminous tree, it's gonna be more high nitrogen than a non-leguminous tree. So, um, anybody here not know what legumes are? Okay, so then it's all ranges of nitrogen to carbon. So 
whether it's everything feed, I think that most foods that we're going to put on the soil feed both groups. It's just some will be more available to one, and it really depends on the timing placement. If you're stomping it into the soil or you're tilling it in versus laying it on the surface, it's totally different. So um, again, we talked about those bacteria not being able to like jump or leap or really move around a whole lot, even the modal bacteria. So they need things that are, this, and it's particle size. Like as you know, in your compost, if you chip the wood one way or another, it, it really changes things. Um, the particle size. So fungal foods, hay, stems, and of course if you have a nice second cut hay that's mostly leaf or an alfalfa hay that has alfalfa leaves, high nitrogen, it's going to be different than if you have a, um, a first cut that has lots of stems and seed heads and things. Dry brown leaves, so when you, we try to get our pastures in the winter to, do you in New Zealand have a dormant period where the grasses go brown, where it's cold enough? Yeah. Because yeah. to to having the animal eat some of that brown stuff and green stuff, like if we can leave, they eat everything. yeah. But if it's only green, you get the squirts, right? If they're only eating lush, fresh green, sometimes, or if the green isn't shiny with fatty acids, right, or some kind of energy, the animals can have excess nitrogen and they can get the squirts and they're not gaining and they're not performing well. If so that's one reason why, like in our grazing programs, we recommend leaving a larger, longer residual before winter. In our area, those will turn brown, a lot of them. And then in the spring, you have some green and some brown. And so the, the animals are grazing a much more balanced food for them. That changes their manure decomposition in the field and what it's, even the manure, we say, okay, manure is a bacterial food. Well, there's a lot of different types of manure. <laughs> and we go into that in our programs. like. Because it's a range. There's manure that's extremely acidic and smells, and like there's manure that's stacked up with hay and probably has more fibers and more carbon in it, right? So what the animal's eating, I say feed your soil like you feed your cow. Like if you're feeding your cow in a way that's going to keep his or her gut healthy, it's going to feed your soil in a way that's going to keep your soil more in a range for pasture. Um, and so really material on the soil surface, the placement is a more fungal food, again, because of those hypha that can go up and grow up and digest it and pull nutrient into your soil. Um, so fish hydrolysate is a fungal food because it has more of the bones and the oils and the skins in it. Fish emulsion, I did have that on here, somehow it's not on this, oh there it is, um, is a bit more of a bacterial food, it has less of the carbonaceous things. Um, kelp, and of course they both feed bacteria too, don't get me, bacteria eat fish, hydrolysate also, but it's just more of a fungal, it's going to push your field more into that fungal range. Um, kelp, humic acids, oils, if you've got compost, you know, like I do compost at home, if we've got excess oil, I don't put it down my drain, like what do you do with this oil or grease? I'm like, well I either reuse it if it's lard or big enough, or I put it to the fungi, you know, they love it. Um, high carbon foods. So these are on your disturbances chart. It's really hard to read this slide. I need to change it and add pictures and things. But that's a whole. There's a whole chart on that that I break this down differently. Um, and so, is anybody can the best thing you can do right now is think of something you could stop doing that would save you time and money that's disturbing your system in a harmful way, right? Because that's going to save you money and help your system. That's even better than something that's free. That's not only free, but it's actually giving you a boon. Um, if you do something that's free, you're still having to spend energy to do it. If you can stop doing something that's costing you money, you're going to be saving money. So anybody can think of one of those things? I don't know who's coming in. But yeah, thank you. Um, I will send you the slides. There's lots of pictures. And um, if you get on our list, we can go deeper with this. Thank you, guys. <laughs>